So welcome to this final session of the WCRI conference. For this session on the future of work in COVID, I'm honored to have a conversation with Dr. John Howard. Dr. Howard is an icon in the occupational safety and health community, currently serving an unprecedented third term as director of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH. Prior to his time at NIOSH, Dr. Howard served more than a decade as chief of the California Division of Occupational Safety and Health, commonly known as Cal OSHA. You can read more about Dr. Howard in the conference materials, but I'm gonna jump right into the, to the questioning. So Dr. Howard, thank you so much uh, for virtually sitting down with us to talk about the future of work and the impacts of COVID. Uh, to start, can you share with our audience a brief overview of the role and the mission of NIOSH? Sure, happy to. I'm happy to be here with you, John. Um, so the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health had its birth actually 50 years ago uh, in uh, 1971. Uh, we are uh, the product uh, of the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, uh, signed by Richard Nixon, uh, December uh, 29, 1970. And so uh, we were established actually by the act. Our name is in the act. Uh, and I always like to point out for those of you that think that OSHA was established by the act, actually all the duties that OSHA now uh, is responsible for were given to the Secretary of Labor in the act. Uh, so OSHA is, uh, for, for those of you who follow administrative law, OSHA is a administrative uh, creation of the Department of Labor. Uh, NIOSH is a statutory creation uh, of the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Um, and so in, in the 50 years uh, uh, of NIOSH's existence, uh, we've had, uh, I think, quite a transformation. Uh, we are the only uh, federal agency that does uh, research into occupational safety and health. So not only uh, are we established in the Occupational Safety and Health Act, but we're also mentioned in the Mine Safety and Health Act. Uh, and uh, actually we do uh, pretty much all the research uh, for MSHA in the Department of Labor, uh, as well as doing uh, research for OSHA. So uh, within NIOSH, uh, I think the best way to understand it uh, is that we are primarily an occupational safety and health prevention research agency. Uh, we do research uh, that aims at uh, uh, generating new knowledge in the field of occupational safety and health uh, and transferring the knowledge to practitioners, uh, whether they be industrial hygienists, safety engineers, doctors, uh, nurses, uh, uh, industrial psychologists, uh, whatever profession, whatever practice uh, helps uh, keep American workers safe. Uh, so consequently, across our mission, we have a number of different professions. Uh, uh, in addition to industrial hygienists and engineers, epidemiologists, uh, nurses, psychologists, uh, and others. And so, so that's when people say NIOSH, they actually think that prevention research. But because we're the only occupational safety and health agency in the federal government that does uh, research and service, uh, sometimes the federal government has programs that they, um, they say, well, NIOSH, you'd be, uh, you'd be good at. And for instance, we have a program in workers' compensation. Uh, specifically, uh, we work with the Department of Labor and the Department of Energy in processing claims from atomic weapons uh, workers, uh, going all the way back to World War II uh, and up to the present time, uh, uh, claims for cancer arising from exposure to radiation. Uh, we help the Department of Labor uh, establish that uh, the individual's uh, cancer is 50% or more likely to have been caused by their employment and their exposure. Uh, that is a separate statute. Uh, the Energy Employees Occupational Illness, uh, 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 Occupational Illness Compensation Act. Um, and then we have another new program just started in 2011, uh, the uh, World Trade Center Health Program. And that's actually a health plan. It's a federal health plan like Medicare and, and other plans. We have about over 100,000 members 
uh, that are primarily responders to 9-11, as well as survivors who lived around uh, Ground Zero uh, in New York City. Uh, responders both in New York at the Pentagon and in Shanksville. And that's a separate statute that we administer. Uh, so uh, those latter two programs, the workers' comp program and uh, the health plan are not normally thought of as what NIOSH does every day, uh, but they are in, in our institute. And uh, we currently have about 2000 employees spread over uh, eight states and four time zones. Thank you. That was quite interesting. I thought I knew a lot about NIOSH, but I realize your scope is much broader than even I understood. So, um, uh, so you've been at the helm of NIOSH for many years and through several administrations. Uh, does the new administration have any new priorities for NIOSH or are some of the current priorities being given more emphasis? I would say that the new administration in terms of, uh, of uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Centers for Disease, Disease Control and Prevention, of which uh, we are administratively a part of, uh, are concentrated primarily on COVID-19 response. Uh, and for us at NIOSH, we participate uh, with the larger CDC response, especially uh, as it has to do with things that are within our purview. For instance, within NIOSH is the National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory, or NPPTL, located in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, for those of you who know, uh, for those of you who don't, we approve all respirators uh, that are used uh, under OSHA standards. Uh, OSHA standards require NIOSH-approved respirators. Whether they be something as a filtering, uh, simple as a filtering face piece respirator, an N95, a P100, or elastomeric respirators, or self-contained uh, breathing apparatus, et cetera. So, uh, so that has been pivotal in the response. And in addition to that, our laboratories in Morgantown, West Virginia, have, have done a number of studies relative to uh, what are called uh, now uh, face masks, uh, but made out of cloth. Uh, not the uh, surgical uh, face mask that you see often in healthcare settings. Um, we've done research trying to figure out what is the uh, filtration efficiency uh, on the source uh, uh, of the uh, particles as well as on the receiver of the particles. And some of you may have seen our recent MMWR article this past Monday uh, in which our research uh, in that area was uh, showcased showing that uh, these types of, of masks uh, of two to three uh, uh, layer thickness uh, of a tight weave uh, with a good fit to the face uh, can be very, very effective uh, if both uh, the source as well as uh, the, uh, the receiver uh, wears. So universal masking can be quite effective. Thank you. That's that's good to know for all of us as we struggle to find N95 masks. Um, so maybe we could pivot to talk a little bit about the NIOSH initiative on the future of work. Could you tell us a little bit about that initiative? Sure. And I think that we've we've formalized it most recently, but we've been sort of dabbling, uh, maybe is the right word, uh, in, in the future of work for now probably a decade. Uh, looking at uh, the various technologies, first of all, that uh, we're seeing in the workplace, uh, robotic technologies, exoskeleton technologies, uh, the use of sensor technology, uh, the use of machine learning uh, in various aspects, including workers' compensation, I might add. Uh, we did a study a couple years ago uh, looking at the Ohio Bureau data uh, and uh, and uh, abstracting it, so to speak, manually would take us three or four years uh, using a machine learning algorithm. We were able to do that uh, within a few weeks. So, uh, so in addition to ourselves learning about this, we're also trying to figure out the issues relative to uh, these new aspects of work uh, and the safety and health issues. We've also been looking at work arrangements uh, that the, the new work arrangements, the so-called platform employment or gig employment, uh, where there is apparently no employer, uh, there's a platform that connects the provider with the customer. 
Um, and as you know, this has been something uh, that has been, I think, on the minds of of, of lots of folks uh, in the uh, uh, in the employment setting. Uh, for instance, uh, in California, a proposition on the California ballot in November uh, brought the question uh, up to the voters: uh, Are are these uh, are these uh, folks that do this kind of work, uh, Uber driver, or Lyft driver, et cetera, DoorDash, et cetera, TaskRabbit? Folks, are these employees in the legal sense? In other words, are they in, uh, entitled to all of the safety net uh, in the various uh, federal laws like occupational safety and health, uh, or, or are they not? Uh, what's your vote? California voted to say, no, we don't think they're employees. We think they should remain as a business relationship. Other states are looking at that. And so those work arrangements have safety and health implications. And the issue of how do you study that, for instance, uh, is one that's extremely important. Uh, for instance, um, what are the risks of being a gig worker? Uh, well, does it have anything to do uh, with the issue of how much control you have over your workplace? Uh, does it have anything to do with the lack of discrimination rights, with the lack of worker protection rights? Uh, this is a new area of research, I think, that that we uh, have been looking at. So we put the whole thing together uh, under these law, broad categories of workplace, work, and workforce. Uh, and there are many, many sub-issues, as you know, within each of those. And we said, look, this is a whole future of work studies program. Um, and so it, it ranges through all of those different categories. And we decided that we needed a cohesive initiative. So that's how the initiative started most recently. And you can go to our website, uh, enter the future of work, and you can see uh, our paradigm of, of, of work, uh, a place, work, and workforce, and the various topics that we're looking at under each of those categories. I might also mention, John, that you know one of the issues we're also getting into in that initiative is well, how do you predict the future? <laughs> or how do you prepare for it? Or how do you even know what future is coming? And that's the issue of strategic foresight. And a number of you listening may be very familiar with this. It's, it's, it's becoming quite popular in the both private and public sector. And people are learning how you create scenarios based on snippets of information that you're getting about the future that may not make a whole lot of sense to you, but you create scenarios of, of various futures because you don't want to be surprised by the future. You want to say, oh, we thought of that scenario back a couple years ago, and it looks like that one is maturing, uh, whereas some of the other ones are not. So that scenario making uh, is very important in strategic foresight. So we're training our folks at NIOSH uh, in our uh, Futures Initiative to be able to do that and to be able to assist others. So I think that's a new, um, interesting uh, academic science, uh, which actually at the University of Houston, uh, Heinz and Bishop started a number of years ago. And there are now futures societies in which you, and futures journals that you can read about how to do strategic foresight. Very interesting. So perhaps we could dwell into a few of the aspects of the future uh, that are that in some sense are already here. Maybe we could start with automation. So it's certainly playing an increasing role in the workplace. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of automation from a workplace safety perspective? Well, I think uh, the interesting part before we get to the, the pluses and the minuses is the fact that uh, when you look at companies and you ask them about their future and what they're interested in and where they want to put their investment, a lot of company surveys will say, we want more automation. And they're actually planning to adopt more automation. And it may be because one, it's more cost efficient. Two, they can't find the skilled workforce to be able to uh, run some of this machinery, and automated machinery gives them that ability. So, so there is, a, I think, a significant amount of data showing that companies are moving in that direction. Now, they may not be able to automate every single type of process, or because you can automate, 
doesn't mean you can't. So the example I always use is computer vision, which is a, a AI uh, capability. Uh, so we all have heard about autonomous vehicles uh, and the ability of the vehicle to sense what's in front of it. That's the whole issue of computer vision, which now is an AI subdiscipline. Well, just because you could automate a school bus, do you want to put 30 fourth graders on the school bus? How many parents are going to say, yeah, great, no driver, no nothing. We're going to put 30 fourth graders on the bus all by themselves. Well, you probably could automate that bus, but you probably are not going to because it's not acceptable. So there's a dividing line between what you can do uh, and what you can't do in terms of automating. So technology may have an, a social acceptance limit at some point. So back to your question, you know, uh, clearly the advantages of automation uh, are to reduce uh, human error often in, in many cases. Or um, in the case of unmanned aerial vehicles, when you send a worker into a confined space uh, in which there may be a low oxygen content, you certainly do not want to do that. But you may want to dispatch an unmanned aerial vehicle into that space, for instance, uh, in terms of, of doing that. Now, that is a, a type of automation if you think of automation in the broad sense of the word. On the other hand, if you think of automating um, the traditional industrial hygiene focus of taking an instrument attached to a human being, holding it, and going out and taking measurements in the traditional exposure assessment, paradigm and you say well let's automate that by putting a whole bunch of sensors around that workplace that would be able to sense uh, carbon dioxide or low oxygen or benzene or beryllium or whatever and we're going to have those sensors feed that data into a central repository uh, and then that traditional industrial hygienist not only has to make sure all those sensors are working right, but they also have to make sure that the data they're getting from that sensor makes any sense in terms of the process. So you may be able to automate that exposure assessment, but you may not be able to, one, figure out whether it's giving you the right data. And the challenge, I think, for traditional practitioners in industrial hygiene and safety engineering is how do you become a occupational safety and health data scientist? Because you have to be able to know what algorithms those sensors are using and whether you're getting garbage in, garbage out, um, and be able to figure out, well, what kind of risk mitigation recommendations should I make based on this 24-7 uh, 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 data input? So, uh, so every uh, type of automation issue that you can think of, and we'll talk about, let's say, a collaborative robot working in close um, uh, proximity to a human worker. Well, is there a stop uh, feature on that robotic arm that will, when it comes into contact with somebody, will immediately stop? Uh, or are we gonna have injuries related to that robotic arm uh, interfacing with with the human. So so every time you you look at one of these automated features, you have to figure out the safety and health uh, issues associated with the automated feature. So uh, it, it's usually a very complex uh, issue. The last issue I'll mention with automation is the one that that economists take uh, most seriously, and it's it's really a, a a huge discussion point, and that's technological job displacement. The idea that, uh, like Andrew Yang wants to give us all a basic income because we're not going to be uh, actually working anymore because uh, all of these automated uh, types of, uh, of devices are going to replace us. Well, I'm not sure about that. I, I think they're not going to be a substitute for many of us, but they will be a complement for us uh, and help us do our work. But, but let's say that issue, which we've seen in manufacturing, where you have a lot of automation going on in manufacturing and you've seen a real decrease in the number of workers in manufacturing, a steep decline, and yet manufacturing productivity has increased. So the two curves are going in different direction. So you say, well, have those workers been displaced? Are they out in the street? 
Well, when you look at the data, and economists have shown us that there are about 60% more jobs that were created, that, that exist in 2018, than existed in 1940. So it, it's that constant argument of job creation, job destruction. Aristotle talked about it in 350 BCE, where he was trying to figure out, well, if draftsmen are able to use these tools, are they going to lose the, their ability to, to have to have somebody else help them do the work? And these people can be out of work. So that discussion has been going on for thousands of years. And I think that, again, uh, that's something that if you read the economics literature, it, it still goes on. Uh, but, you know, look at all the new jobs in information communications technology. Look at this conversation that we're having. Um, look at the people that are helping us do this, that are experts in this particular virtual platform. Uh, their jobs probably didn't even exist, maybe even before the pandemic. I mean, who heard about Zoom before the pandemic? Uh, so even in this last year or so, we've seen some new jobs open for us, the people who curate uh, our virtual ability to connect. Uh, so, so that last issue of automation is, is the big economic issue that I, I suppose we'll continue to debate for a while, in addition to the safety issues uh, associated with using a lot of these products, uh, on top of just the challenge to safety professionals to have their, their practice layered now onto their normal practice, a lot of these automated sending enabled internet of things type of marriage between the cyber and the physical. Very interesting. So um, jumping into the impact of COVID-19 for a minute, and I know we're gonna speak more about that during the live Q&A shortly. Uh, we have seen certainly an increase uh, during the pandemic in remote working. Uh, so this is likely to uh, remain for to a certain extent even in the post-pandemic world. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the benefits of remote working as well as some of the challenges for employees and employers uh, and what can be done to mitigate some of the challenges? Well, I think you, I think it's an understatement <laughs> that uh, virtual work now uh, is going on. I, I think, you know, except for those essential workers, uh, mail carriers, uh, construction workers, uh, grocery store workers, uh, drugstore workers, uh, pharmacists, et cetera. Uh, a lot of uh, essential work is, is still going on. Uh, th there's a divide, I think, between many of us who can work from home uh, and not have to go in the office uh, to those that cannot at all. And, and that, that category of essential work uh, is really ones that that we're trying to focus on at CDC uh, to get the vaccination capabilities to those workers since they are the ones who are most at risk because they're the ones that have to see us across their partition to get a, in the checkout line, et cetera. So I think that's a, a very important issue. In general though, for those of us who are engaged in this new virtual uh, workplace, uh, it, it certainly has its positives uh, in that work can still go on. Uh, and we're very fortunate to be able to have the technology to be able to do these uh, types of, of communications. Um, the negative side, I think, is uh, very interesting. It's this idea of having telepresence um, all the time and not knowing where the boundary is between work and home. You know, you went to an office and you left at a certain time, unless you were a workaholic, but so you left at a, work, a certain time, you were not in the office, you were not at work. You were clearly in another space doing something else. Well, if you're at home, unless you have a rule in your house saying, look, the computer goes down at five o'clock, the phone goes on, I don't do anything, I'm now off of work. That's good. That is that, that constant telepresence. Uh, I think is uh, a real negative. And that creates a lot of stress if you're unable to do that, especially if you're at home with the kids uh, and the rest of the family, um, that can be very difficult to separate those boundaries. So uh, I always use the term that, that work and life has become very porous. Uh, we're, we bleed <laughs> into each other's time space. Uh, and, and that's not right. We need to clearly separate work 
from our other activities. Um, so I think that that probably is is the most uh, concerning is, is some of that work related stress that can can take over uh, the time that you should be relaxing and resting and 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 refreshing yourself doing other non work activities. You have a concern about cumulative trauma disorders. Um, the, if you look at the BLS data, there was a pretty sh sharp decline in carpal tunnel syndrome and other uh, cumulative trauma disorders in the workplace. But as we as we morph over into working more at home, do you have any concerns about seeing more of these kinds of cases? Yes, I, I think you make a very excellent point because the the home workplace, if you will, is not quite as supportive, both equipment-wise uh, and also in terms of your your work table that you have. I know I started looking at the table that I was using in in my house and thinking, you know, here's this sharp edge of this table that I'm resting my wrists on. This is not right. And so the accommodations that you have to think about doing at home with with no support, you know, in a workplace, often there are people that can help you do that, um, is 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 more challenging, I think. So as we continue uh, this period of time, it will be interesting to see whether some of these common uh, key stroking type uh, injuries we're going to see a bump up uh, in them. Uh, and so I think you make a very excellent point, and, and I agree with your your uh, your hypothesis there uh, that it is concerning uh, because the home office people are uh, on their couch with the computer on their lap uh, doing all sorts of uh, uh, crab-like motions <laughs> with their wrists that we tell people not to do uh, in the office. So uh, so yeah, I, I agree. It is a concern. Thank you. So now, uh, Dr. Howard, we'll move to some live question and answers. And we're back. Um, so, Dr. Howard, there were a couple questions that arose uh, during your presentation. I thought I would ask those first before we turn to uh, some co questions about COVID-19 in the workplace. Sure. So, uh, there's, there was a question when you were talking about the work that NIOSH does related to fa face masks and respirators. Uh, Denise asks, are you doing any research on the use of face masks in high manual labor or cold weather work and uh, its impact on cardiac function and pulmonary stress? So the short answer is no. The long answer is, you know, there are so many different varieties of face coverings out there that it really strains the laboratory experimentation a bit to be able to do that. Uh, also, you know, varying it by physical task. The one thing that did not happen uh, when we were doing the, the tape presentation that I wanted to mention to viewers is um, ASTM International just published uh, February 17th, uh, their new standard, uh, their specification standard for what they call barrier face coverings, which the rest of us call masks. Um, and what this standard does is specify a number of different things in terms of design and performance criteria. And that, uh, standard now, uh, I think, is going to change the market in barrier face coverings or masks in the following way. Uh, one, I think manufacturers of face coverings will want their face covering to be tested according to the ASTM international standard. Testing laboratories are currently gearing up to receive that, if not having them in house, I'm not sure. Uh, and so I think we're going to see certified labeled ASTM international certified face masks or barrier face coverings as ASTM refers to them on the market. And I think that's going to really allow us in NIOSH to then do what Denise is asking is to say, okay, we're going to take one of these certified labeled 
ASTM International mask, and then we're going to vary the conditions of work using that type of mask. So I think that will help our research uh, in that area. So sorry for that long answer, but I wanted to get in uh, that folks knew about ASTM uh, International Standard, which you can uh, uh, look up. Uh, they've made it available. You don't have to pay for it. Uh, if you go to ASTM International F3500, uh, um, uh, you can download it and look at it. Thanks for that very useful information. Uh, so when you were talking about the future of work, uh, Jeff asked, I was wondering if you could talk more about workplace injuries in the future. Seems like increased use of automation, remote work, and technology jobs that you mentioned could continue to contribute to decreased frequency and severity over time. Uh, do you have any thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, great, a great question. I saw that in, in the chat. Um, you know, it's a hard question to answer because it involves us sort of looking into the future. And even though we can employ a lot of strategic foresight, um, uh, hopefully we're gonna be more right than wrong. But the way I would approach it is, I think if the automated device uh, or robot or whatever you wanna call it is a, is a total substitute for human work. In other words, a worker entering a confined space to measure the oxygen level. If, if that job's eliminated and you send in a drone instead, then, then that device is a total substitute for a human, a human job. And I think in that case, the injury goes away too. But if the device is a complement for us, like a collaborative robot, or remember back in the 90s when we all didn't have keyboards and desktop computers and laptops and all that, they are a complement for us, but look at the out, sort of that original Australian repetitive stress disorder and then the American uh, cumulative trauma disorder, all of a sudden we saw this injury uh, uh, blossom. So I think, I think Jeff's question is, is, is really super great because it'll, it, it allows us to think about a, a number of futures. For me, it devolves on, is it a substitute or is it a complement for a human worker? And I think most of the things we're seeing now are going to be complements where a team of workers and collaborative robots perhaps are working together. And I think that could increase productivity, but it also could increase injuries. That's really, really interesting. So um, when you were talking about working from home, Kirsta asked, how should we manage ergonomic related safety risk with staff who continue to work remotely on a more permanent basis? Well, you know, I think this is a real challenge for employers uh, um, and insurers both, uh, because, you know, we had what, 15, 10 to 15%, um, maybe and that's pretty high of telework going on pre pandemic. Now, you know, uh, for instance, in the federal government here, we have a 100% telework. You have to get a special excuse to come into the office like me um, and, and work. And so you go from, you know, very low to very high. Um, it's, it's a really radical change and employers, you know, were not, did not have the logistical operational uh, evaluation capability to say, here are my rules for you if you work with a computer at your home. You know, some employers did, some employers didn't. So all of a sudden now we have all these folks, a lot of folks except essential workers working at home. And I think if we continue that in the future, and you know, so far the surveys are that productivity has not dropped, and in fact productivity has increased with all this telework, employers now, as you look at some of the surveys, are shedding office space and all that sort of thing, trying to realign how they are doing their work. The Twitter corporation, Jack Dorsey, said, don't come back. Uh, we're going to work at home forever. So, you know, I think it's going to adjust what employers have to do to ensure health and safety of their worker at home. So I think that's going to be, a, a again, you know, job creation, job destruction. That's going to be a whole new profession to be able to assess uh, home office uh, issues. Great. Thank you. So I guess we should now pivot to a few questions on COVID-19 and worker safety. So generally, um, what can employers do to keep employees safe in our current pandemic environment? And are there any resources to go to for guidelines and best practices? Well, uh, CDC has a lot of resources. We published over 5,000 uh, guidance documents and the best way to, uh, to access them is to go to the CDC site 
uh, enter your topic. Uh, we've done some several on some specific workplaces like protein processing plants, uh, uh, beef and, and pork and, 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 and poultry. We've done uh, some agricultural, some seafood, some manufacturing. Uh, so we've tried to sort of go across the industry sectors. But basically what we're talking about, because as we all know, uh, talking to a group of worker compensation experts, is the interchange between the community and the workplace in terms of the chicken and the egg. Where did this infection come from? <laughs> Was the worker to acquire it in the community, brought it to work, and then they shared it with other workers, and the workers there took it into the community, you know, all that sort of thing I'm sure you've discussed. So, you know, that, that issue, I think, becomes a, an overriding one for us at CDC. It's very simple. You know, we're talking about masking, we're talking about distancing, uh, we're talking about hand washing. And I think what we're seeing in the indoor workplace is this fourth aspect, which we didn't talk about too much at the beginning. But as we see small aerosols traveling further away from the source generator of that particle, and we start talking about uh, aerosol transmission to airborne transmission, we worry about the ventilation issues within an indoor space. So I would add that as number four. And I think those are the fundamental issues that we have to look at uh, in terms of how we protect workers. Proximity, proximity, proximity. It sounds like real estate, real estate, you know, location, <laughs> location, location. But proximity of the workers to each other is really a, a, I would put it number one, number two, and number three in terms of the risk categorization for the workplace. And therefore, proximity reduction becomes the primary risk reduction strategies. And there's lots of ways to do that. And ventilation comes into that as physical distancing when you really have trouble moving people far apart. Then the issue was what's going on with the ventilation. And we're seeing that in the return to schools. And we're going to see that in the return to work issue too. So related to that point about um proximity. We've seen uh, office space has evolved from having some common space with many single offices to a totally open space layout. Given the airborne risks of COVID, do you have a picture of what the future workplace might look like in terms of layout and design? Well, that's another great question. And I think there's a couple of futures there that we can imagine in that area. Uh, our experience uh, in doing uh, assistance uh, to the protein processing industry uh, in terms of a, an assembly line, people very close together. One of the things that, that we suggested is, well, when you can't physically distance, can you put partitions between the individuals? So, which is the opposite of the open concept workplace. But at the same time, the open concept could work if you spread them the workers a little farther apart and you ventilate the space well. So again, that issue in the indoor space of the ventilation coupled with the proximity of the workers, I think is key. And there's no magic formula for that. Um, I always recommend people look at the ASHRAE standards uh, and other uh, authoritative sources. And we do have a ventilation guidance. You can go and Google CDC, just put CDC ventilation and you can download our 12 page uh, guidance about ventilation issues in indoor workplaces. CDC is certainly a very valuable resource for employers. Um, so one of our members and attendees, Brian Zaidman of the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry just reminded us that tomorrow is the 110th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York City. Um, thanks, Brian, for reminding us of that. This tragic event led New York to adopt a workers' compensation law that was a model for other states. Throughout history, tragedy has often led to progress, new ways of seeing the world, and the identification of previously unobserved threats and risks. We obviously are still in the midst of a tragic event, this COVID-19 pandemic. You discussed strategic foresight. So what have we learned from this tragedy that will ensure that employers and workers are better prepared for the next pandemic? Well, uh, you know, I, I take some exception to, to, the, to the, descriptor, uh, the descriptor better prepared. I'd say prepared at all. I'm not sure we were prepared at all. And I think one of the uh, futures here that I can imagine is that employers are gonna have to pay 
much more attention than we ever did, which was awfully low in terms of, of the things that, that occupied employers' attention in the workplace of infection control. You know, that's something that goes on in hospital. There are people appointed in the infection control committee. There's usually a coordinator of infection control. All of that sort of thing is bread and butter in a hospital setting. But it has not been a bread and butter issue in the non-healthcare setting. And I think that's going to be a real sea change as we go forward, if we continue to pay close attention. Now, I think one of the issues is that we all may be forced to pay close attention. You know, CDC has all this guidance about workplace safety and health issues, but it's guidance, it's recommendations. And as we all have heard, uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration may be considering an emergency temporary standard for infection control specifically to COVID-19 as a grave danger to workers and, and as necessary to control that hazard. And they may uh, do an infection, uh, a, an emergency temporary standard, which lasts six months, uh, uh, but they may also then begin work on a permanent infection control standard, which came up in the Obama administration for a brief, a brief time. Uh, and then uh, uh, the administration left and, and the issue was dropped, was not taken up again in the Trump administration. But we may see uh, work on that. And I think that would, again, support the idea that uh, employment settings are going to have to pay attention to infection control, the non-healthcare setting. And, and that's going to be a real challenge because uh, we're not good at that in the non-healthcare setting. So it's going to be a lot of education and awareness of how it's applied in that setting, especially when it's in a hospital, when you don't have uh, a lot of patients there with infection uh, and, and, and the decades old history of controlling infection in a healthcare workplace. So I think um, OSHA may spur us on here uh, in the new era of being prepared for the next pandemic. So uh, along the lines of infection control, I would think that larger companies that also might have occupational health departments are probably also in a better position to, to uh, look at and, uh, and do something about infection control than smaller businesses would have. So are there some uh, potentials for disparities and in, in along the, from this kind of difference in the ability to do infection control? Oh, I think so. And I think when you look at uh, the across industrial settings, even you can see disparities uh, that are, uh, for instance, in the protein processing industry, uh, the model, the business model, the operational model they're using people are shoulder to shoulder. Uh, now, do you redesign that whole thing? Um, how do you redesign it? Um, and so I think for some uh, industrial sectors, it's gonna be a, a real struggle. Even in outdoor sectors, uh, like agricultural farm work, we've seen outbreaks in uh, California and Florida and other states have been written up. Uh, we're farm workers. I mean, here you are outdoors. Um, how much more ventilated can you get? And we have issues relative to their housing, relative to their transportation in groups, and working uh, close together, e even in an outdoor setting. So I think infection control in the non-healthcare workplace is, a, is going to be a very complex issue. And as you point out, I think there will be disparity in terms of the size of the uh, establishment. Uh, clearly, large employers do better in this area. Government has to step in and help the small employer, uh, including uh, associations that, that uh, have a lot of small employers uh, within, within their ranks. Unfortunately, Dr. Howard, we need to wrap it up here. We were so fortunate to have you as a participant in this conference. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that marks the end of our two-day virtual conference. We sure covered many topics, though. Of course, COVID was dominated uh, in our discussions. I, I want to remind you that if you missed any of, this, of, of the sessions, recordings will be available on the conference website for the next three months. We hope that you have found the conference interesting and helpful. We encourage you to complete the conference session evaluations. They help us very much in terms of planning for future conferences. Though, frankly, I hope not for a virtual one, if we can help that. Um, and thank you all for the visits to the ex exhibitor booths. As we mentioned, we will be making a contribution to Kids Chance for the number of visits to the booth. Looking to the future, 
I hope very much to see you in person at our 38th Annual Issues and Research Conference uh, on March 15th and March 16th, 2022 at the West End Copley Hotel in Boston. Please mark your calendars and let's hope that we can see each other there. Thank you so much for attending our conference. Please be safe.